Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, colleagues, greetings. Um, my name is Ricardo and I will be moderating this webinar on protection of older persons in forced displacement. Just as a first uh, housekeeping uh, suggestion, you will all have the opportunity to activate your cameras and, and microphones. Please keep your microphones muted when we're not speaking. Okay, if you want to speak, raise your hand, etc. Not to lose more time as we have a very interesting agenda and while colleagues are, are still joining, um, we are here in this webinar celebrating the the first of October, two days later, which is the the International Day of Older Persons. Um, the theme uh, given by the, the UN Secretary General this year is aging with dignity, the importance of strengthening care and support systems for older persons worldwide. Now, in developed, in developed settings, in developing settings or in non-conflict afflicted areas, care system, care and support systems uh, include both health uh, responses for persons experiencing, older persons experiencing health conditions such as dementia, etc., but as well social protection service, social welfare services for older persons that are experiencing situations of deprivation, um, vulnerability uh, or experience of um, abuse, exploitation, lack of resources, lack of access to food, housing, etc., which in brief transform to conflict uh, and disaster afflicted countries transform into protection issues, right? So making this translation to bring the day to what we are going to, to discuss, um, we are going to focus today on protection situations and protection risks uh, faced by older persons in, in the areas where we work. And we will have a very interesting panel with partners and as well, I hope that we will have some of our UNHCR and other UN partner colleagues sharing their own experiences. But without further delay, I would like to, to give the floor to Josep Herrero, the Global uh, Protection Cluster Coordinator, to, to make a, a brief introduction on, on the day and what we are going to, to explore to focus further the theme. Over to you, Josep. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo, and thank you to all the organizers of this event. And thank you for all the work that you are doing to uh, better visualize the situation of older persons in forced displacements and to improve their response or response and their protection. I always say that uh, any protection response that is not inclusive by definition is discriminatory. So we must ensure that when we respond, we are inclusive and we consider the different needs and different capacities of each sector which uh, of the community and adapt to our responses and thank you very much for organizing this panel and for inviting me out of we estimate that there are 120 million persons forcibly displaced in 2024 and nearly 4 million individuals are over 60 years old which represents 3% of the total displaced population. So we're talking about, I mean, a considerable amount, number of people. We're talking about 4 million persons, men and women, over 60 years old. This group of people, older persons, they encounter numerous obstacles during forced displacement and humanitarian crisis. They are often at higher risk of abuse and neglect, frequently left behind in displacement or unwilling to leave their homes, becoming the last to flee and facing greater dangers. Elder abuse is often underreported and is frequently perpetrated by family members, caregivers, or the individuals on whom the elder depends. The lack of reporting and older persons' participation in violent surveys results results in minimal data on elder abuse and it's going often totally underreported and unnoticed. Many 
co-reputation cluster members, including UNHCR as the agency, are implementing an a gender and diversity approach. And they work to tailor Mediterranean responses, ensuring that no one is left behind and that all the persons can access the services offered and meet all their basic needs. Addressing barriers to ensure access to essential services, such as health, wash, and livelihoods, is a responsibility across all sectors, as outlined in the protection and streaming principles. However, as protection actors, we have a specific responsibility to address the protection needs of older persons. When they face human rights violations, such as elder abuse, gender violence, loss of land, housing, property, and other protection concerns. In today's webinar, we'll explore resources and field practices to help us uphold our values and responsibilities toward these populations. And in this seminar, we'll learn today that the world is aging very rapidly. By 2050, there will be more people above 60 years old than 15. So, Mediterranean response and protection for people who are displaced has to adapt and evolve to meet the needs of a growing number of older persons. So, thanks very much for visualizing this situation and organizing this event. And thanks for inviting us to join. Back to you, Ricardo and colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Giuseppe, and thanks to the GPC for organizing this discussion and for setting the ground. As you've mentioned, we have a considerable population that is going to be growing in the in the next years, and we have shared responsibilities with other sectors in in, in conflict and displacement situations such as wars, etc. But then, very specific protection concerns, and and this is what till now has been remaining invisible because of lack of knowledge. Today we want to, to start breaking this, this type of silos in, in knowledge, and I would like to invite our first uh, speakers from uh, HealthAge International to do an introduction to the protection issues faced by older persons. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Pep, for this uh, introduction. Uh, probably I'm going to touch uh, touch base on some of the things that you have mentioned uh, uh, in your introduction and to get uh, to get go deeper into some of the topics. Uh, just to make sure, are you able to see my screen well? Yeah? Yes, we can Excellent. see. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so just um, let us uh, um, before we let us first highlight that the global population is aging much faster than in the past, right? Um, and population aging is a global phenomenon. It is characterized by a significant increase in the proportion of older uh, people within a population. Uh, populations are getting older um, due to increased life expectancy rates and a continued decline in fertility rates uh, globally. And so societies worldwide are experiencing a profound uh, demographic shift. And as mentioned, the, uh, the projected proportion of the population is expected to increase to around 22% by the year uh, 2050. Uh, these numbers highlight why it is very important to consider aging and older people in our uh, work. Um, this figure here, um, it highlights the population structure in less developed regions, uh, uh, comparing years 2005 and 2050. Now, if you can, you, you take a look at the older age groups in 2005 and 2050. We noticed that older age groups are increasing as years go by. Uh, and hence the difference between the 2005 in red and 2050 in yellow. While population aging started in high income countries, for example, in Japan, 30% um, I believe of the population is already over 60 years old. But now it is low and middle income countries that are experiencing the greatest change and shift. And by 2050, two thirds of the world's population over 60 years will live in low and middle income countries. Um, just to stress uh, uh, on some of the uh, uh, look at some of the data and figures on older people. Um, in 2020, the number of people aged 60 and older actually outnumbered children uh, younger than five years. 
Uh, by 2030, one in six people will be aged 60 years uh, or over. Um, and projections show that by 2050, more than 80% of the world's older people will live in low and middle income countries where disasters are more likely to occur and their effects are felt uh, more severely. It is also important to highlight that an estimated 46% of older persons have one or more uh, disabilities, and it's very important to touch upon this intersectionality and to talk about it a little uh, further. And finally, an estimated 4% of all displaced persons in the world are older people, though a lack of um, age disaggregated data no, may working. actually hide a, a much higher percentage. No, okay, um, just to, to give a bit of a, a background, who is considered to be old, right? An older person is defined by the United Nations as a person who is aged 60 years uh, uh, or older. However, in many countries uh, um, and cultures, aging cannot be looked at as only a number, but rather needs to be uh, understood in its complexity and interaction with other dimensions such as gender and uh, um, diversities. In many developed countries, the age of 65 sometimes is used as a reference point for older persons or the age when the person becomes eligible for all old age security um, benefits. It's also important to note that older old refers to uh, people who are over uh, 80 years of, of age. Sometimes families and communities, they often use other uh, sociocultural explanations to define age, such as, for example, being a grandparents, uh, um, having gray hair and wrinkles, especially since actual birth dates of older people are often uh, um, unknown. So basically, and in conclusion, there is no exact definition of old, as, as the concept has many different meanings in different uh, societies. Um, it is important to know that there's a large diversity among older people, right, in terms of their health status and capacities. Um, biological aging is only loosely associated with a person's age because sometimes 80 year olds may have physical and mental capacities similar to many 20 year olds and others may experience a decline at a much younger age. So we need to, to really avoid presenting older people as a homogenous group and to try and describe older people on how they may differently be impacted to ensure that we actually leave no one uh, uh, behind. Um, identifying diversity in older age is a determining factor in providing inclusive uh, programs that address the wide needs and capacities of older uh, people. Okay, so now I would actually like, uh, um, I would like to launch a poll um, and I would like to hear your thoughts and your ideas on what constitutes as protection risks faced by older people in uh, um, emergency, in forced displacement and in um, emergencies. So I'm going to do a poll right now and um, just give me a second until I put the question up. Um, yes, and I'll give you two to two minutes maybe to get some answers. Yeah, I think you have it in front of you right now. Yes, I have it myself. I don't know if colleagues with uh, not uh, you and your account can can see yes, the poll. Yes, we can see it. Excellent, okay, excellent. Thanks. Okay, so I'm already seeing some. Uh, I'm going to share my screen to see the um, the results. So there's discrimination. Um, I can see there's physical violence as well, abuse, uh, um, GBV, excellent, um, elder abuse, uh, there's a familial result, um, health services, um, delay in evacuating, discrimination, abuse was mentioned a lot actually, risks in later life, uh, um, what else, familial results, isolation, um, sexual abuse, uh, physical violence as well. Excellent. Um, 
so there are some 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 risks that are actually being uh, repeated neglect uh, um, access to services i see is being repeated um, as well um health conditions yes conflict um other emergencies as well um associations of witchcraft um what else access to service familiar results yes all of these are actually uh, um, very important risks i will keep continuing i will share my presentation again and we'll see if other risks also are um, appearing just for one, while you're bringing yeah. up the slides, there was in the chat as well, uh, older persons without caregivers, lack of access, exactly. neglect, and lack of access to assistive products. Thank you. That's excellent. Excellent answers. We're also seeing a lot of uh, abuse and neglect being repeated a lot, lack of access uh, to, to, to services, uh, to health services also being uh, uh, mentioned a lot. So all of all of these uh, uh, answers are extremely uh, um, important. Um, so let us before we. Uh, um, uh, I think all of your answers are are very relevant, and thank you all for your uh, uh, interaction and providing some of these. Uh, um, uh, answer social isolation I see in the chat yes <laughs> lack of services thank you all for the answers I've seen that there's a lot of uh, a lot of you mentioned similar ris uh, risks let's say right and um, it's important as well before I go on to mention some of the uh, um, uh, uh, most important risks let's say uh, uh, older people they often face a number of pre-existing conditions right and challenges that are associated with their age with their with their gender as well and with other characteristics that sometimes affect their ability to respond and to recover from uh, um, uh, uh, crises and these challenges are frequently worsened by the emergencies increasing the vulnerability of older people and leading to more severe protection uh, issues these challenges may include uh, poverty uh, uh, disability perhaps uh, specific health issues issues uh, and others okay now if you look you you've mentioned a lot about isolation right you did talk uh, um, a lot about isolation and and you are right uh, separation sometimes from families or communities will lead to isolation which is possibly the most important factor in creating vulnerability right older people living alone they risk increasing levels of marginalization uh, and this may include the loss of the support uh, mechanisms on which they had once uh, uh, relied upon. And we need to remember that there are different uh, family structures, such as, for example, older person headed households, female or widowed headed households, households with large numbers of dependent children. They also create uh, specific protection risks for older persons and their uh, uh, families. Sometimes involuntary family, uh, family separation can affect older persons and increase their level of isolation. Other uh, risks that you also mentioned, which was repeated a lot, uh, being a victim uh, um, of abuse, right? Untested assumptions that we have about the care and respect that's offered to older people, combined with the lack of consultation, actually creates an environment in which serious abuses occur. Uh, rape, GBV, prostitution, theft, confinement of older people, sometimes they go unseen and unchallenged, and we will touch base upon abuse uh, in the upcoming uh, slides. There is um, also the, the older people may be uh, left behind as their families are displaced, for example, by conflict or disasters because sometimes they are unwilling or unable uh, um, to travel. Uh, um, they may be left uh, to guard uh, family property, to guard belongings, or for example, because the family faces an uncertain future in terms of uh, their shelter uh, and livelihood. And as a result, older people remain without access to services and potentially maybe become targets to different types of violence and um, abuse. 
Also, it is worth noting in this uh, particular case that older people are also at a high risk of potential secondary impacts, right? Where they continue to stay, for example, after a natural disaster, because many older people have no one to turn to during emergencies, especially if they had lost uh, their support and their care and the family uh, members. Um, of course, I'm, I'm sure in, in most cultures and in most uh, settings, if they were not doing so already before the emergencies, many older people find themselves looking after young dependents whose parents are missing. Uh, and those who were doing so already before the crisis may actually find themselves suddenly having to care for many other younger uh, um, children. And of course, the issue of the uh, housing, land and property rights uh, being ignored. And this is already a difficult issue uh, that may become a challenge if the rightful uh, holder is an older uh, person, right? Older widows are um, sometimes regularly the victims of discrimination and exclusion due to many different reasons, such as traditional beliefs, probably social norms, and accepted uh, cultural uh, practices. Older people, sometimes they may lack uh, uh, the legal documentation to prove uh, ownership of uh, land and other um, assets. And even before the crisis, HLP issue was already difficult, especially if the rights holder is an older uh, uh, person, especially those who have lost or never possessed uh, ownership um, documents. Sometimes older women and uh, widows who are uh, not always recognized in inheritance laws also face challenges in proving ownership of lands and uh, homes, and they may also be uh, at higher risk of forced um, eviction as well. Um, these are, we presented some of the most common protection risks that are faced by, by older persons in all their uh, uh, diversities. Looking at this uh, figure right now, uh, this figure actually is taken from a report uh, um, entitled, If Not Now, When? This was a report uh, published by uh, uh, HelpAge International that looks at the extent to which older people's right are, rights are being upheld in emergencies and their needs met. Uh, the impact of conflict on older people, of course, as we mentioned, can be devastating, but, but we have to remember that it's not necessarily the conflict itself that's the main challenge. In the report, we asked older people what the main safety risks were for them. Right. And both older women and men, as you see in front of you, identified the same top five risks, uh, neglect and isolation, denial of resources, opportunities and services, financial abuse, emotional abuse, and finally having no safe place uh, in the community. Uh, more than a third, actually, of both Older men and women identified neglect and isolation and denial of resources and opportunities as the highest risks for older uh, people. Now, let us take a closer look at, at um, elder abuse, right? Elder abuse, UN defines elder abuse as a single or repeated act or a lack of appropriate action occurring within any relationship where there is an expectation of trust which causes harm or distress to an older uh, um, person. Uh, elder abuse is violence or any other types of harm because of older age. Uh, it can be carried out by those who are close to the older person, such as family members, caregivers, or even by social structures and um, institutions. Um, one in six older men and women actually experience abuse and only 4% of those uh, um, older people report it. Uh, um, all forms of elder abuse are underreported uh, and they are often hidden, uh, largely because they are often perpetrated by the family members. Uh, um, or maybe because the often uh, older people may uh, um, they themselves uh, refuse to report it for many different reasons, 
due to pro possibly having this, they don't want to disrupt the relationship that they have with the person that is harming them. Uh, sometimes it's fear of uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, left in isolation, uh, probably fear of retaliation, fear of stigma. Sometimes even older persons, they do not recognize it as, as being a form of, of abuse. Uh, and many older survivors may not be aware or even have access to, to, to services or outreach materials. Sometimes they do not include uh, images of older individuals um, as well. Also, it's important uh, to note van violence, abuse and neglect. This is an, an, an umbrella term that is used to describe the different uh, forms of, uh, of violence uh, uh, and abuse um, occurred to an older uh, person. And during times of conflict, older people are at particular risk of violence, abuse and neglect, specifically older women, uh, older persons with disabilities and those with um, support needs. Um, I don't want to go through the different uh, types of uh, uh, elder abuse and their examples, but at, as you can see in front of you, uh, um, there is the physical abuse, there is the emotional abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, as we mentioned as well, uh, financial abuse uh, um, and many others and there are a lot of different examples that could be provided under these different types of um, elder um, abuse. Uh, GBV, gender-based violence uh, uh, perpetrated against older men and women actually may often be included under the umbrella of um, elder abuse, right? Unfortunately, there is no right to protection from all forms of uh, van in older age under any UN international human rights treaties that applies generally or specifically uh, um, um, to older uh, persons. The issue of uh, GBV um, of older persons has honestly received very little international attention specifically to older women and this is because mainly GBV data is usually uh, restricted to women of reproductive age, so basically ages 49 and younger. And, and so this results in prevalence of GBV among women aged 50 and older actually being uh, uh, underreported. Uh, uh, to understand the complexity and the factors contributing to GBV, especially for older people, uh, the life course perspective as defined by Help Age is a way to reflect on how to manage the risks or, or opportunities that people in every society face at key stages in life in order to minimize and address the accumulation of inequality as people uh, um, as people age. GBV occurs across the life course, it's systematic, it is widespread, and of course it affects women and men of all ages. And, and, and I have to say that violence can be exacerbated in later life and also uh, um, impacted by a growing effect of violence across the uh, um, life course. Um, finally, before the final slide, it's also we did mention intersectionality uh, a lot, and I did want to touch upon this very important uh, uh, word, let's say, because intersectionality it actually allows us to, to, to recognize that every individual experiences abuse in a different way, right? And may face additional barriers based on different uh, diversity factors such as the race, their sexuality, their age, uh, their uh, abilities, and so on. And sometimes multiple discriminations actually lead to a higher risk of GBV and other forms of violence in uh, uh, later life. The diversity wheel uh, um, is a simplified representation of UNHCR's approach uh, uh, to intersectionality, right? Because, because intersectionality can actually further hinder participation in humanitarian actor and uh, action. 
And so it's important for us to acquire data on age, on sex, on disability as a minimum requirement to start to identify the risks for um, a better response. Uh, and finally, before uh, I pass on back to, to Ricardo, just a few more uh, key messages. It's Older people are constantly on the move. They are at high risk of protection concerns and frequently subjected to one or form, uh, one or more forms of violence, abuse, and neglect. Right? And we, international, regional, national legal frameworks, unfortunately, fail to adequately address the violence, abuse, and neglect to which older women uh, are subjected to. So it's important for us all as humanitarian actors to, to, to strengthen the, the collection and analysis of sex, age and disability uh, disaggregated data to actually inform policies and, and program. And it's also important to, to mainstream older people's inclusion uh, through integrating age into existing uh, gender, disability, and even protection mainstreaming policies and uh, action plans. And, and uh, we need to always remember to consult older people and to promote their participation and empowerment because this is the responsibility of all humanitarian actors and uh, and agencies. And finally, we need to remember to recognize the capacities and the capabilities and the contributions of older people and support them to advocate for their rights to maintain or take up within their communities any uh, uh, any role and, of course, include them in every stage um, of the response. Thank you very much for uh, listening in and for your engagement. Sorry for go going over uh, time and uh, back to you, Ricardo. Thank you, Rowan. Many colleagues have been joining as well. If you want to share questions, please use the Q&A function on the, on the ribbon or just the chat. Uh, we will have an open conversation at the end as well if we have time. But just as you summarized, uh, older age is, is a fluent uh, uh, reality. There are many countries with different definitions. This is important to note. So we shouldn't have a strict view. But second, what I think is very important for what you shared, there has been in the in the last years a, a, an approach to looking at uh, older persons as an inclusion issue, right? We need to include older persons. And we see that this, as Pep said at the beginning, the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator is a, this is a responsibility within protection mainstreaming. Yes, there has to be equal access, but there's not only that, and there's as well a responsibility to protect about, uh, against uh, human rights violations, right? And just uh, bringing in a case, uh, everyone probably in the in the audience will, will remember one of the cases if they've witnessed one, but I remember a case of a, of a woman who was closed in the closet or in the laundry room by, by her mother-in-law full of bed sores in the just just in the ground uh, in in a small mattress and she called us just to to get her out of her life right uh, without any any dignity for for that uh, human being and of course in a humanitarian setting there that is a very strong challenge right because there's no place where you can get that type of of person to be to be safe and the type of intervention requires a, a very structured type of approach, which is what we haven't had till now, but now with the with the support of the speakers that we are going to, to have, uh, we, we will start having in a more systematic way. There was a pilot, but well, I want to spy, uh, spend more on, uh, more on this. I will hand over the, the floor for, to Kisti Genash from the Norwegian Refugee Council, who is going to introduce us an approach that we can use for uh, this type of interventions. Thank you, and over to you, Kisti. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just to check, um, can you see my screen? My yes, we hear yes. and we see the screen, thanks. Okay, lovely, thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name is Kirsty Yanash. I'm NRC's Global Protection Case Management um, Advisor. 
Um, and together um, with Emily Krem from the IRC, um, we have been implementing a project um, to um, develop a um, interagency uh, guide to protection case management. Um, and um, yeah, so glad that we had that introduction that included all of those um, definitions around protection concerns um, that are facing older persons. Um, um, a really good leaping off point. Um, okay, um, so um, the Global Protection Case Management um, Initiative has been working over the last um, uh, just under two years um, to um, take this uh, document that the IRC and UNHCR developed in 2020, the Your Guide to Protection Case Management, um, and um, to field test it. So it was yeah, it developed in 2020, um, but was not able to be field tested. So we have been field testing it in Iraq, Yemen, Myanmar, and Ukraine, and really asking them to use this document, let us know what is working about it, what is not working about it, what additional information they need to make this as effective as possible. And we've been feeding those um, lessons learned and also asking for other experts um, to review the document as well at a global level. So we have, um, we've been working in coordination with the um, Global Protection Cluster and um, the and a Protection Case Management Advisory Group, um, our AOR colleagues um, who have also provided sort of a revision um, and expertise and have been working with um, other field-based um, actors um, to make them aware of this approach. So again, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it um, a little bit. Um, so just to bring a definition to the approach, so what is protection case management? Um, the quickest way of defining this for most people is to say that it, it looks like um, what we think of when we talk about social work. Um, so um, case management is um, a service based on social work methods and principles. It is an individual approach where a caseworker and a client um, are brought together uh, and they work really closely to understand what the protection concerns are that the client is facing. Um, so that's called the assessment phase and then to develop a case plan that might include you know, how to support a client to access services that are available, how to coordinate that and sequence their access to those services, where there are gaps or um, uh, I guess complications in terms of what they need to advocate for, for those needs being met. Um, the protection piece of protection case management refers to the objective of the approach um, to um, target or support those who are at risk um, or impacted by violence, coercion and deliberate deprivation. And a strong part of the case management approach is about that one-on-one -on -one relationship um, by a, a trained and uh, professional caseworker. But the defining factor um, is who are our um, our clients or our service users. So in protection case management, that is people um, experiencing or recovering from violence, coercion, deliberate deprivation after a humanitarian event. Um, this um, is our initial point of um, analysis, but we also, of course, need to factor in how that risk is impacted by age, um, by gender, by disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, other groups that individuals um, might be um, associated with their migration status. Um, and it doesn't, um, we don't take the approach that um, a client is um, you know, completely vulnerable and has no strengths of their own. We take a strengths-based approach, thinking ab about what resources um, do they have that we can be increasing in order to um, increase um, individuals' safety. Um, but of course, after a humanitarian event, um, individuals um, might find it difficult to manage their safety. They might feel um, overwhelmed. They might uh, feel like they have less capacity than they had before the event to um, manage their, their safety and their well-being concerns. They might have difficulty accessing support and to navigate um, a kind of complicated um, new set of services and systems that 
um, pop up in the humanitarian response. Um, and um, someone mentioned social isolation being sort of a huge um, factor that older persons grapple with. Part of um, what clients often tell us um, about the impact of protection case management is that it is that supportive relationship that they develop with their caseworkers that's a, um, hugely impactful um, and supportive in um, having someone sort of re-stabilise their lives after, after a humanitarian event. Um, so we're talking a lot about the criteria of um, protection case management. So we ask our um, as part of the service model, um, um, implementers to do a protection analysis that will help caseworkers understand um, who has um, protection needs in their community, and that of course should consider um, you know, age and disability factors as well, but also to have an understanding of any national systems and supports um, for care. Um, and bringing together an understanding of um, other um, supports that are on the ground. So that might include the, um, the health system or social welfare systems. And that this should be revised and kept up to date as well as, um, as the context um, changes. So this is um, the um, uh, breakdown of what we mean when we're talking about violence, coercion, deliberate deprivation. Um, so we're talking about um, individuals who are impacted by abduction, kidnapping or enforced disappearance. Um, you mentioned um, a lot of um, elder abuse. So this, this approach includes individuals who are at imminent risk of or who are being impacted by um, physical abuse, psychological abuse and emotional abuse um, or torture, in, inhuman or cruel degrading treatment. Um, it, as part of co coercion, we include individuals who are at risk of being forcibly separated from their usual caregivers. So, of course, this is not a, um, we're not referring to um, minors in this case. We're referring from people, um, older persons or people with disabilities who normally require care, um, who've become um, separated um, from that support. Um, it also includes individuals who've been forcibly displaced. Um, are experiencing forced labour, forced recruitment, or experiencing um, discrimination and stigma. It also includes individuals who are impacted by arbitrary or unlawful arrest, detention, um, and impacted by denial or obstruction of access to services as a result. In terms of um, the older persons um, profiles that our um, field testing teams have supported throughout um, the, the process of um, field testing this approach. They have worked with um, individuals who are requiring care who were abandoned um, during sudden surges in conflicts that required other members of the communities to flee. So we had those individuals who were um, unable or unwilling to leave areas of conflict. Um, and then found that they had a reduced capacity or mobility challenges that placed them at greater risk. Um, we've also supported older persons who are um, at risk of um, physical, sexual, psychological abuse in the home and seen that where that has been exacerbated by conflict and displacement and disruptions to normal care arrangements. Um, we've also seen um, similar to the example that um, Ricardo just gave older persons with a cognitive impairment or with a neurocognitive disorder um, whose caregivers were not providing safe and dignified care and resorting to some really harmful um, uh, practices, um, again, often within the home. We also wanted to share a couple of um, more detailed case studies as well. So we have um, Miriam, who's a 78 year old woman from Sudan. She fled with her family from Khartoum to South Sudan with her daughter-in-law and her four grandchildren. She had not um, heard from her son very, in um, several months and she was um, concerned for his safety and worried that he had um, been killed in the war. 
Um, they settled in a rural area, but they were not um, a traditional farming family um, and were not able to um, create a successful livelihood um, in that in that context. So the family did not have enough to eat and it would be Miriam who would often um, go without food to make sure that the younger members of the family um, did eat. Um, she was increasingly getting confused, um, forgetting um, or asking you know, where her son was. Um, and she was getting in more and more sort of agitated arguments with her daughter-in-law who she was relying on for some care. Um, and their, um, their sh shouting matches and arguments um, started to get more physical and her daughter-in-law was um, hitting Min Miriam and chasing her um, out of their um out of their home um and the before she engaged in protection case management the last time that she got into a physical fight she'd um fallen backwards um hurt her head um and had to go to the clinic so this is um a woman whose um case plan included um a, an assessment of her um social structures um and different um options that she would like to think through in terms of her um, care arrangement. It also involved coordinating with medical service providers, um, thinking through her um, nutrition um, and her level of stress and distress um, and how she, how she could be supported to sort of cope with kind of a very difficult situation. Um, I will hand over to um, Emily who um, Emily, if you'd like to present the next case study, and also Emily has um, uh, work from IRC that really helps um, case management teams to sort of think through the links between the protection case management approach um, and supporting elder persons in more detail. Um, and Emily, would you like me to keep going with the slides? That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll finish up with the the two case studies that we're presenting, and then I will go through um, the approach that Kirsty just mentioned. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Emily Krem. I'm a I'm with IRC, and I'm working with Kirsty on the protection case management approach. Um, so we have the one of the other uh, cases that we've worked with is Anton. He's an older man who lives in Zaporizhia in Ukraine. Um, and he's lived in his apartment building his whole life and is really unwilling to move despite the physical risks around the um, um, aerial bombardments. Um, he has expressed that he would rather die in his apartment than be displaced or to, to move somewhere else. And he just can't imagine how he would live in a temporary shelter. Um, before we had connected with him, he had been living, um, living in his apartment and had been hit by shelling. And it was also considered structurally unsafe. Um, he had walked with a cane and he had fell and he'd been injured um, and he was not receiving medical care. Um, and his whole his family had left um, because of the, the conflict and he is just being increasingly isolated in an increasingly unsafe environment. Um, so that was another type of case where protection case management could support, um, including in making sure to provide that therapeutic relationship and building trust and making sure to talk through his options around um, uh, finding temporary care um, outside of a, an unsafe space, um, how he, trying to see if he could be connected with his family, uh, working through making sure he could get health services and really trying to reduce that isolation while keeping in mind um, his own sort of like preferences and, um, and his, uh, yeah, and what he would like. So that's a, a case study. Okay, um, let's move on to um, guidelines. So this, these guidelines were actually developed in 2021, um, led by IRC, supported by BHA as part of the um, Safe at Home um, project. They were done in collaboration with HelpAge International. And these guidelines are meant to complement the case management approaches. So we had Kirsty present uh, the protection case management approach, but these guidelines are also include gender-based violence, which Rowan had spoken about, 
um, as, a, as a key risk. And as well, child protection considerations for older persons that are caring for children. So while focusing more on protection case management and gender-based violence, there is an additional module um, on child protection case management as well, but from a carer perspective rather than obviously um, a client perspective. I'm going to be focusing, I'll, I'll go through um, some of the tools. Um, just to flag within these, within this guidance, there is a lot of guidance on how to integrate and how to um, be inclusive, how to make sure your case management approach is inclusive of older persons, adaptations, um, uh, disability inclusion, all of that, which is a core function of uh, making sure the case management people can actually access and receive proper care. I will not be going over those um, tools and those resources just because the focus really is on violence against um, older persons and um, but they're in the they're in this uh, document as well. Um, and there is plenty of annexes, et cetera. Okay, so um, going through, I won't go into super details of this, but there is um, a breakdown of what are the signs and symptoms of abuse and neglect of older persons, um, which can cut across um, many different groups of people, but it includes, um, for example, being aware of what bed sores or extreme isolation or psychological distress um, for social um, restricted access to services, for example, um, <clears throat> financial, um, being unable to access resources, lack of money, um, pension checks or um, access to multipurpose cash assistance in their name is being withheld by certain caregivers, et cetera. So there's a pretty detailed list, but Rowan also uh, reviewed the different um, components as well. So here we're going through what are the key considerations that we need for integrating case management services for older persons experiencing abuse. One of the key functions is going to be um, uh, medical treatment or access to healthcare. So as anybody who has worked with older persons before, there is gonna be a complex um, health needs as well, working with different types of medication, chronic diseases, medical treatment, emerging health problems, et cetera. Um, there is also might be need to be coordination with health teams for assistive devices. Um, and that is going to be something that the health teams are going to lead on, but it, it could include eyeglasses, hearing aids, mobility um, aids such as canes, et cetera, um, or including large print or, or braille materials to help people read, et cetera. Um, caregiving support. Um, that is also going to be a key thing to think through. So particularly when families are experiencing multiple stressors, I mean, such as humanitarian contexts, they're gonna, they might struggle to provide care to older persons in the family, and they may need additional support in order to do so. Um, it's also going to be important to make sure that there, the relationship between the caregiver and the older person is not um, is a supportive one. And if it is not a supportive one, if the caregiver is um, the perpetrator, the perpetrator of abuse, making sure um, the safety is prioritized and um, and working through that is going to be a, a key function of the case management support. Um, psychological care and support is another key thing to think through. Um, while they might need um, protection case management is a psychological, a PSS intervention on the IAC pyramid to level three, it's a focused um, non-specialized support. They might need more additional support as well. Um, one of the key things is forming, again, as uh, Rowan and Ricardo mentioned, is social isol isolation and the feeling of isolation. So that might include peer groups. Uh, that might include um, increasing social connections as much as possible, particularly if they're alone and caring for themselves. Um, and so that's going to be a, a core function. Uh, livelihoods is going to be another thing to think through. Now, not everybody should be or can work, but oftentimes older persons would like to retain their sense of purpose and contribution to the household. So figuring out ways um, that is safe and appropriate um, for them to do so, 
another thing to think through, or even accessing, making sure they're able to access assistance, such as cash assistance, et cetera. Um, oftentimes, older persons are unable to physically access some of the distribution points, and so they're reliant on other people in order to access that, and so making sure they're actually getting that assistance is something that a caseworker can keep an eye on. Um, we talk about other protection services and legal support. So older persons are at a higher risk of family separation and are often left behind. And so they might need assistance in terms of getting connected to loved ones or from people who are farther away. Um, referrals for the resettlement process, if um, if appropriate. And then um, for legal support, there are countries which have legal frameworks for addressing abuse in older persons, um, and so they might need additional like legal support, et cetera, depending on what their interests are and what their circumstances are. And then as well, <clears throat> older persons are less likely, depending on their generation and depending on where they grew up, um, they might not speak um, certain languages and or they didn't grow up with having birth registration, et cetera. So making sure they have the right documentation in order to access the services could be another core function of casework. Um, and then lastly, uh, in terms of safety, making sure that home is a safe environment. And if it is not, figuring out alternative um, situations that work in the context. So those are just some of the key considerations. Um, Additional risk factors um, that we should also keep in mind are households facing strained resources is that research shows the main predictor for abuse of older persons is dependency on a caregiver and unhealthy power dynamics. And these underlying drivers of abuse can really be exacerbated, particularly in times of stress. Um, for, so an older person may report financial stressors of the caregiver or household we're gonna, are gonna play a key role in their experiences of mistreatment. And they actually may wish to um, still engage with the caregiver or a family as a whole to expand their livelihood options and really trying to figure out ways that they can support the, the client better. Um, community related issues is also gonna be something to think through while communities can be great sources of support and trying to reduce social isolation. They might also be a perpetrator of the abuse, again, depending on the context, um, such as ageism, ableism, or even harmful traditions, such as being accused of witchcraft um, that can place the blame um, for older women, for older, uh, persons, particularly for women. And in these such situations, it's going to be important to work with the community as a whole in order to um, address these problems. Um, other risk factors are families with a history of poor interpersonal relationships. So if families have histories of discord or, per or poor personal um, interrelationships, um, adult children may feel resentful or harm of older parents and less willing to help them cope with the challenges of old age, and the appointed caregiver may not be providing the care that the older person needs. Um, so that is, again, complex family relationships is going to be a, a core um, consideration for the caseworker. Um, whether or not this is initially reported, uh, gender-based violence, including sexual violence, um, is, a, is a risk factor and clients should be referred to the appropriate um, GBV caregiver, um, GBV uh, provider. So that's gonna be very important. And then lastly, um, some families or caregivers may be unable to provide the actual support required. Um, either they don't know how, they haven't been supported to do so, or maybe they're um, maybe they're a younger person and they they need support in order to do that. So it's also mm -hmm. making sure the family um, is supported um, if they are able to provide that comprehensive care. Okay, and now I'm going to highlight some of the different um, annexes or the tools um, that are provided in this toolkit. So one is um, a situational analysis. So this is um, is a tool which you can use in order to really understand um, what aging means in that context. So as Rowan mentioned at the very beginning, aging is that there's a continuum depending on contextual and social factors. And so this is a tool that you can use in order to really understand what aging means in this community, what are the perceptions of abuse of older persons and what are the different types of risks that are present in the location where you're working, understand the different types of how that manifests, um, 
also looking at the legal framework and practices, like what is the what is mandatory reporting, what is the um, are there any is elder abuse um, particularly outlawed, et cetera. Um, what are the coping mechanisms and protective factors? What are the, what does the social um, network look like? And then also looking at the available response and gaps, like what are the specialized services that are going to be necessary? So doing this analysis before you start is going to be very important for you to define your risks. And as Chrissy talked about, defining your protect your eligibility criteria, as well as looking through what the solutions are going to be. Um, Annex 2 is um, another toolkit around this situational analysis that you can use, which are focus group discussions, which is allows you to gather information directly from the community. So it's um, this includes like all the questions that you can ask that you can actually speak to older persons themselves and really understand what their risks are. Annex 10 is an assessment that you can do in order to understand activities for daily living. So here, understanding what the relationship is between the caregiver and the older person in terms of capacity for both individuals, and then help to examine the risks for burnout, neglect, and abuse. Um, try to understand the dynamics of the relationship, um, uh, trying to understand what, um, how, um, what are the, what are the activities that the older person needs the most assistance with um, and how the activities could be modified in order to support a greater um, independence. Here also um, the idea is this is not like a one-time static um, assessment that should be used throughout the case management process to really understand what, how the dynamics are changing or how the um, client's health is situation and it could get impact whether or not they can access um, certain they can take care of themselves etc so this is an ongoing process but can really help understand what the actual needs of the client are and what the case and the caregiver is etc and then lastly we have um just a legal analysis framework which allows us to do a bit of a deep dive into what the legal framework is in each of the contexts where we're working so is there a local or a national action plan to address violence against older persons? Is there a disability legal framework which could apply to older persons in terms of accessibility? Um, and also, are there any specific like gender-based violence laws, et cetera, that could impact um, older women who are experiencing um, gender-based violence? So these are just a snapshot of some of the different tools that can be used in order to inform your case management practice. And that, and that is it in terms of the the toolkit. I would be very happy when we share out. Ricardo mentioned we'll be sharing out the slides. We'll also be sharing out um, this um, guidelines as well, which are quite detailed. And we'd be very happy to answer any more questions if they come up once people can take a look through them. And I think that is it. So Thank I'll pass you. it back over to Ricardo. Yes. Thanks, Kirsty and Emily. Uh, as we've seen. The situation has changed in the past. There was a, a conception of seeing these issues as, as inclusion. Uh, then we have a, a question in the chat. I'm, I'm going to pass already to the Q&A section. And we have a, a, a question from our colleague Amani, if I'm not wrong, from, from Kenya, actually. Uh, so more of a refugee context where um, the uh, the debate, right, is uh, UNHCR teams, and this refers very particular for, for to UNHCR uh, operations, where our own colleagues have been uh, providing case management services for these cases, right? It has been traditionally easier to identify uh, partners or uh, including national partners, national NGOs, or national services who can provide uh, this type of support to, to, I mean, support to children who are facing child protection issues, including abuse, neglect, exploitation, violence, et cetera, or women who are experiencing GBV is easier, relatively, yeah, I'm not saying it's easier, it's easy, but it's easier, right, to identify these type of partners. While it is more challenging to identify um, partners who would be taking over this this type of alternative uh, way of pro pro providing social 
services in in emergencies as, as or, or displacement settings and as you have uh, showed that there is a spectrum of interventions right where we we have situations where we have isolation and lack of access to services producing a complex type of protection, still a protection situation where, where an individual is actually facing isolation that can lead to, to safety risks and protection risks, and other situations where we have clear instances of violence, right, or specific perpetrators that are damaging or, or putting at risk the, the safety of the individual. So, um, I, I, I will take a start, uh, start with this first question, and then we'll go to the second one from our colleague Yuka. But um, the for the for the first one, uh, a question that I, I would like to pass the question as well to our colleagues, right? So, uh, of course, for UNHCR is a is a challenge, right? When when there are not adequate partners uh, around, and when there is a, a protection officer who may be at the same time managing partnerships that are related to care protection or other type of interventions, and at the same time following individual cases in the communities because of the absence of other partners. So what would be, if not, it's not a very challenging question, Emily and Kirsty and, and um, Rohan as well, in your own experience, alternatives in the absence of, of partners or possibilities as well to reach out to to your organizations to get uh, this type of, of services um, functioning over to you if if you would like to take it a call. Uh, sure, I can, I can go quickly and then pass over to Rowan and, and Christy. So um, I would say that the easy answer when there are partners would be to work with your partner. So there are protection actors in a lot of the contexts who are trained and have the capacity and the ability to take on that case management component with the leadership and support from the, the CBGP team and UNHCR, but can actually hold those individual relationships. Um, now, if there are locations where you don't have partners or um, those relationships don't already exist, it would be seeing to foster um, to foster those relationships and then also working with other smaller organizations and actors to provide that care, but then making sure they have the resources and the, the support, like um, resources from like the, the time, the financial resources, et cetera. And then if not, then trying to bring in partners who can provide those resources and link with them so they can build their capacity, they can work together on that. So it's not that they'd be in this by themselves, but to be able to provide that network of support. So I think the easy answer, even if it's harder in practice, would be to really rely on your network of um, protection actors to provide that care um, and recognizing that it might take a long period of time in order to build up that capacity and build, it's not going to be as of tomorrow they can take on the role that the CBBT is doing, but over time they will be able to. I don't know if Christy you. wanted to. Yes, Christy or Rowan, if you want to add anything. Um, yeah, I mean, I um, just to expand on what um, Emily has already said, I mean, this doesn't necessarily resolve um, what Amani is facing um, at the moment, but certainly we encourage people who are looking to get into protection case management to start thinking about the sustainability and the exit of humanitarian services at the point of establishing mm -hmm. those services. So that's about looking around at any national um structures or existing sort of helping supports, um, which could also be at a community level. There has been some really interesting work um, around engaging community members to take um, some of the load um, of case management um, with that um, technical support as well, um, as well as you know, looking at um, national social welfare systems and seeing what we can do to contribute to their capacity throughout the humanitarian period so that they could take over. But also to acknowledge it is quite an intensive service, so it's not really, um, it's something that we saw at field testing um, with um, NGO protection officers trying to do monitoring, case management, and also community-based work. And it is really hard to provide the level of quality of care, especially for high-risk um, sort of urgent cases, if you also have other responsibilities. So it's also about thinking about, do I have the bandwidth to provide 
um, this type of service um, at the to the demand that um, is being provided. Thank you. I don't know, Rowan, if you want to add anything. Thank you. I think both Emily and Kirsty uh, covered this. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go to the next question shared by Yuka. How can caseworkers uh, prioritize or coordinate uh, the care and support, including medical health services, uh, when there are many issues that are identified, uh, which is often the case of older persons? So the, the second question, I think, complements the first, how to operationalize a multidisciplinary team approach in humanitarian settings? Would like to take a start to this. Yeah, I can start on this and um, yeah, others can build. Um, I think thinking about the, um, the field testing experience that we had, um, this was about having a really strong sense of um, the criteria for who your um, service users or client base um, would be. And we did have um, a lot of programs who were doing something like protection case management um, but who didn't really have a sense of um, that kind of risk focus. And it did mean that um, they were trying to provide um, this type of service to a lot of people with um, chronic illnesses and health needs um, because, you know, they wanted to do life-saving work and because people with that profile also can benefit from this case management style coordination and care. Um, but from a from a protection perspective, we really needed to ensure that we were sort of staying in our lane and um, health um, cases were being advocated for within um, the health service um, conversation and community um, and that protection workers were um, really focusing on those individuals who are facing the protection risks that we that we've heard about um, so far. Um, it is it's a difficult thing at at a field level to manage when you have so many people in need, but really kind of creating that guardrail for your caseworkers in a with a strong criteria um, was really useful, as is making um, really strong relationships with um, health services and other services so that you're not in a position where you have to um, provide all of the things that you're more um, about in a facilitation role um, in terms of accessing other specialised services as well. Um, you certainly don't, um, you can do case management where services are limited. It requires a bit more um, uh, creativity and technical support, um, but you don't have to have a multidisciplinary team internal to your organi organization, but it will definitely like deepen the level of care that you can provide if you're creating really strong referral relationships with your health services, with um, mental health services um livelihoods um uh, basic needs that kind of thing yeah emily did you have something to add to that thank you christy i don't know emily or rowan if you want to add i wasn't sure if um if you were looking at um the individual client itself or the eligibility criteria in general if you were thinking about the individual client um themselves and they presenting with multiple needs um uh, really what our advice is to the caseworkers is, is making sure initial safety and like well-being is like the, the core function is like what do they need in the immediate term and often the client will tell you so uh, if there's an overwhelming um thing of the overwhelming amount of needs and it's going to be hard for them to prioritize working with the client to really understand what they would like to prioritize because it's going to be impossible to do everything at once is always the advice that we give to our caseworkers Thank you, Emily and Kirsty. If, if I can summarize or give an, an additional reflection on this, there are two angles of, of looking at uh, these type of situations where individuals have multiple needs, right? One would be to identify among all those needs, what are the, the priority ones, right? And um, the second one is who, who is identifying those needs? The, one of the issues that, that we face many times is that because protection actors are more uh, embedded in communities, there may be identifying situations 
where uh, actually the primary needs are not related to protection, but are related, for example, to accessing health uh, facilities or health services that are not accessible, that are maybe far, that where there may be no outreach services, etc. And there may be a tendency for, for some uh, organizations to absorb this caseload as if it was a protection issue, right? While what we were discussing was the, the need to identify, well, to, to prioritize situations, at least for protection case management, where there is a there is an immediate uh, risk uh, related to a protection uh, concern related to violence, etc., and the need to coordinate, as Kirsty mentioned, with uh, existing health services, including where those are existing outreach services, right? So there would be a message as well to to health uh, colleagues to ensure that there are community health workers that are as well present in areas and establish establishing these cross referential pathways right because it is true as well that many times uh, health providers are those who are identifying protection situations right where where the a, a, a clinic or 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 a clinical visit to a person who is at home may identify that the person is facing actually a protection issue that is, is facing elder abuse, right? And then having a possibility to, to refer to protection case management. Of course, we are talking about very ideal situations where we have both services um, together, but otherwise coordinating at this, that would be very interesting. And this is something that in this new approach for protection case management is, is very encouraged. Um, going to the to the next question uh, is about funding, right? Uh, so Jasmine from Iraq is asking if there are specific funding opportunities available for refugee-led organizations focused on assisting older persons, given the limited awareness and engagement in this area. So here we come to to national stakeholders, right? To localization as well. And whether uh, I see uh, two two questions, we could we could have two questions here, right? One would be localization, and in particular as well, uh, funding for refugee-led organizations. And here I can come with a quick answer that would be well, the the refugee innovation fund, or the 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 grant agreement that UNHCR has for refugee-led organizations that are starting. And, and want to become more structured to be able to uh, access uh, regular funding. But then we have the second point, right? That, that is actually funding on protection of older persons where there has not been traditionally a very clear stream, right? In, in um, this type of funding and where usually if there has been some funding has been rather on inclusion right which is more of a technical or advocacy type of support and less of an operational uh, type of approach with with case workers who are in 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 operations or in in the field i don't know if if you have any any advice to give as well in in this second aspect on how to to put together right uh, projects uh, to maybe not in particular for older persons because we as, as we've been saying protection case management is inclusive of uh, situations faced by older persons but not limited to uh, those that would be a more efficient way of, of putting protection uh, services uh, forward but i don't know if you have any any advice in this regard In funding always a very difficult answer, right? Or a question to answer. Yeah, I mean, um, I definitely so defer to Rowan around specialized funding sources, of course, for older persons, but from um, or just building on what Ricardo mentioned in terms of um, there is in all contexts is going to be protection funding and there's protection programming. So it's really, I think, taking, trying to make sure that your partners are supported in order to make sure their services are one inclusive. So actually older persons are able to access the service and what are they doing around that? And then also really encouraging the protection partners to partner with um, organizations that have the connections with the community. So um, are there older persons organizations in the country 
um, is help age international on the ground. Like, how can we make that connection? Um, really, I would say encouraging um, that sort of connective, uh, making sure the humanitarian is connected with the, some of the more focused older persons uh, services. And I think that that's when you're going to be able to um, leverage the existing opportunities as well. Rowan, I don't know if that. I think this is Emily. Yes, thank you. I'm I'm having troubles with my connection, so I'm switching off and on my camera. I think this is a very good uh, point you made. I think um, having a collaboration with different uh, organizations specialized in different things, trying to bring in all the cross-cutting issues uh, together and working with those specialized organizations will make your approach stronger because eventually, and as we mentioned during this webinar, working with older people, we do not work with them alone, right? We, we need this holistic approach. We work with their families. We work with the caregivers. We work with the community. We need them also to, to be embedded with the community protection-based activities is, um, as well. So there's this entire, uh, nothing specific, let's say, for organizations, specifically for older people. My advice would be to approach it along with other specialized organiza uh, organizations as well. Over. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, Christine, if you want to add anything on this. So I, couldn't, I could see you. No, nothing for me. Thanks. Okay, awesome. uh, I'm putting in the chat uh, two resources. One is the UNHCR grant agreement with organizations led by displaced and stateless persons. This is a funding modality to support uh, refugee led and as well uh, organizations led by stateless persons. And at large, it has been used as well to support um, organizations. Uh, led by any type of marginalized group, right? So, for example, organizations of persons with disabilities or the persons associations, there has to be always a, a connection with forced displacement, right? It, it shouldn't be an organization that is just a national organization working on, on their own citizens. There's always this, this link either to refugee or internal displacement. But it is a modality that is very useful as at least to start the the organizational capacity. There is a saving of $12,000, so it's not a very strong amount, but at least it can be used, for example, to facilitate training, right? If we want to organize the training on case management for, and, and to use the materials that have been shared by colleagues, if we want to start setting up a more structured type of of work around case management, starting to 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 have, um, for example, a better data uh, system, etc. This is a type of funding that could be interesting. Otherwise, there is as well the Refugee Innovation Fund, right? That is open regularly, and where we can take as well inno innovative approaches and and transforming services would be uh, for, to, to ensure as well the the uh, um, protection of older persons could be for example presented as as an innovative approach if if there's anything to to consider on it on on that transformation as an innovation uh, or innovative approach we are coming to an end i don't know if i see there's a new post let's see if we can uh, uh, here, yes. So I see a last question. Let's try to, to take one uh, more. So limited or no provision of assistive devices for other persons discourage the older person to engage in the community. Improved plan and need to be done. Are there any experiences besides uh, help each international? So here I will take as well a first um, uh, st uh, step. Um, I'll put in the chat, we have a guidance on facilitating access to assistive devices that was recently launched. And what is important, again, to, to highlight, and Emily touched uh, on it very quickly during her presentation, but it's very important, um, the provision of these assistive devices is a, a health, primarily a health intervention, right? Assistive devices, technical uh, devices, uh, rehabilitation, those are uh, health interventions. It is true that in many contexts, including in humanitarian settings, 
um, but in developing settings, uh, access can be achieved through social protection, right? So social protection funds may be having uh, allowances to for persons to access uh, assistive devices. However, it's always a health partner, is the medical uh, or, or the or the health ministry that is providing these these uh, support uh, services. Now, uh, what in unity are we are trying to put forward is a collaborative approach It's not closing the door for protection colleagues to never again provide this type of services but a, an advice to do it always with the supervision and the collaboration with the health partner and at the minimum conducting training and there is a training that is called tap the training on assistive products that who has in appears in this guidance and i can put the link as well in the chat but this is something that that you can do then of course is the question of funding the accessibility of, of of the materials in itself and this is as well in the guidance reflected with this, uh, existing partnerships with unicef etc but i'll i stop here we have one or two minutes i don't know if any of you would like to volunteer on on an answer for that no i, I think you covered it just mentioning that another uh, modality that you could um do is also having cash. A lot of protection actors are now engaging more with cash assistance. Um, but again, it's important that we're that it's done in collaboration with the health teams. So like the importance of making sure it's the right assist device fitted in the right way is absolutely essential. Cash is just a modality that could help um, facilitate that, but it doesn't skip working with the health teams. Great, thank you, Emily. So I think we are on the hour already. I put in the chat uh, these two uh, um, additional resources. The the actually I didn't put the second sorry, the um, guidance on facilitating access to assistive technology, and then there's the training on uh, in assistive products that that you can access is online. Everyone can do it, and it's true that for example for a social worker level or even a teacher can be as well very useful to identify needs and do adequate referrals. With this, we are going to close the conversation. Thank you so much for being here. We've, we've been very, I, I'm very proud to see that we have a very good numbers and a good number who stayed as well till, till the end. Uh, in the past, this has been very low level um, acceptance or, or follow up, right? This, this type of to topic. But thank you very much for, for your interventions and hoping that you take the resources that we've shared already and that we will share in a follow-up uh, follow email and, and you take those to, to your realities. Thank you very much. And thanks, of course, for our speakers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Ricardo. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.